Okay, so so why don't we then come on in? Um, cool. Why don't we do that now before we start in dive into this formally? Um, so there are containers. This thing called containers. You've heard of them, I'm sure. A container is really just a fancy process that has some Linuxy things around it. No, no, okay, cool. All right. Um, so a container, uh, it's, it's really just a process. Think of it as a process uh, running in kind of this special Linuxy jail. Uh, Docker made it really easy to, to use containers and launch containers, but they've existed for a long time. Uh, Kubernetes is a project that is effectively a scheduler and orchestrator of containers across multiple machines. So you can address a cluster of, of machines, nodes, uh, as a single logical thing and tell Kubernetes, run three copies of this container in the cluster. And here's some information about, uh, it's all declarative, uh, so you declare, this is what I want its environment to look like, and maybe mount this file system in, that sort of basic stuff. Here, here's how I want you to expose its ports to the rest of the world, or just internal to the cluster. Uh, and then Kubernetes takes care of the rest for you. It will do things like monitor those containers for you. Uh, if one of them dies, it will follow rules about restarting it potentially. Uh, it'll capture log output. Um, it really is turning into like an operating system at the cluster level, which is really pretty cool. Uh, terminology that's useful to know is a pod. It is easy to think of as a just a container in Kubernetes. It's its unit of how it tracks a container and how you express to it what a container is. Now, in theory, it's called pod. Everything's nautically themed, uh, thanks to Docker. So a pod of whales is the idea here. Uh, in theory, you can put multiple containers in a pod if you have two things that need to live side by side, like a web, a web server process plus a cache that really just ought to be side by side in the same machine with local access to each other, maybe some shared environment. Then you put them together and they, they always live and die and their whole life cycle is you know, combined with each other. But 99% of the time you're going to see a pod is a container. Um, it's all declarative, like I said, so most people interact with that in terms of like YAMLs. You make these big YAML files that say, here's all the stuff I want my application to look like, and here, stuff it into Kubernetes, and then it just does it. Um, that's the whirlwind overview of what Kubernetes is. Uh, any like basic questions before we launch into this? Nope? Yes, please. So you mean to say that Kubernetes controls the process which we need to we need the uh, is, is it that controls the, the process. It, it controls the process. Uh, yes, yes, it controls the process. Yeah, it is. Kubernetes is like a process manager okay. at the cluster level. Okay. Yeah. So it, it takes uh, uh, it, it has the all the cluster information, maybe one or two clusters, no, for example, two nodes, three nodes, and then it uh, manages the top level of all these three nodes. Yes, yeah, yeah, it'll manage across, yeah, however many nodes you throw at it. Yeah, yes? Are they getting into KVM stuff as well? Instead of just... Um, yes, that is true. Um, it's, Kubernetes is a great scheduler of jobs and work across a cluster, and yeah, people are absolutely using that right now. Um, this is a hot area of development to also schedule virtual machines. So it's saying instead of starting up this, uh, you know, three copies of this container, start up three copies of this virtual machine and keep them running. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an area, a fairly recent area of growth for Kubernetes. N nice hat, by the way. Um, any other questions before we launch in? Cool, you guys can stop me anytime um, as we're going and ask. Uh, all right, so my name is Michael Rivnack. Um, I work at Red Hat. I've been there almost six years. Uh, I've been involved one way or another in Red Hat's container strategy since about the time that we decided that we needed to start shipping Docker-compatible containers to customers, which was like five-ish five years ago, maybe, something like that. Uh, initially, I was involved in the distribution side of that, so a lot of the tooling around how Red Hat distributes containers to people uh, is what my team is working on. Now I'm working on this thing, which is automating the deployment of this stuff in Kubernetes, which is a lot of fun. Um, this is my first Linux Fest Northwest, uh, so I'm super happy to be here. I'm based in, out of our headquarters in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I love the Pacific Northwest. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, just, just down the road. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Good deal. Cool. Johnson City, another North Carolinian. Uh, so anyway, super happy to be here. I've heard great things about this conference for many years, uh, and I'm glad I finally made it out. Hey, this works. Okay, so chapter one, we've got three chapters in this talk. Uh, the meta container as the app definition. Uh, meta containers is a pattern. It's a name that we've put around a pattern of how we've seen successful deployment um, processes can work well. So let's dig into what in the world that is. So when you're provisioning something in a cluster, uh, in Kubernetes in particular, but uh, this will look familiar, I think, for a lot of different kinds of provisioning, there are three levels or three layers of complexity that, you, that we could think about. And the first and the simplest is just creating a full stack of your cluster resources. So this is, at a basic level, telling Kubernetes, um, so maybe you have like a database, an API service, and a front end. So you would tell Kubernetes, these are three services that exist. Here's the container image that maps to each one. Here's how I want you to run it. Uh, here's how I want you to make them available to each other across the network, that sort of thing. Usually this is defined in big YAML files, uh, is what you'll see, or some kind of template that renders into a YAML file. This is the basic Kubernetes stuff. If you went through a, a Kubernetes 101 tutorial, at the end of it, this is the stuff you would have. The second layer of complexity comes in when we have to integrate with external services, uh, which is a thing that, that we do still have to do because there are legacy applications that could be something that was delivered yesterday but just wasn't written to be container native, whatever that means now. Um, there could be a traditional database cluster that you have to interact with. So maybe your company or employer has a database team uh, of DBAs who run high performance highly available databases on bare metal their own way and you have to just talk to them and file a ticket somewhere or whatever it is to get a database for your provisions. So that's, that's what this might be. Appliances are another thing. We have a lot of appliances we see uh, doing all kinds of things from uh, you know, networking management, uh, other kinds of infrastructure, email appliances, DNS appliances and so on. Uh, if you need to integrate with one of those things that's not going to be in your cluster, probably. Uh, so that's something you might have to, to deal with that's outside the cluster. And then finally, there's post-install bootstrapping that we often have to do. Uh, so maybe you just need to initialize a database. You created a database, but now you need to you know, load in your table definitions uh, or, or whatever similar thing you do for the kind of database you're using. Maybe you are actually uh, restoring from a backup, because you do backups. Uh, and, and you test uh, restoring your backups, I'm certain, on a regular basis. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is very hypothetical. Uh, it, it, it is. If we need to discuss this more tonight over drinks, let me know. Um, <clears throat> but that's the kind of post-install bootstrapping you might need to do, or just creating resources in your application after it starts up. So maybe you, like, like let's go through a hypothetical, another hypothetical example. Maybe you work uh, for a blog hosting company and you provision blogs for people. You, somebody pays their $3 for the month and you provision them a blog. You're gonna go through maybe all of these things and at the end of it, maybe you load some default content. Maybe you load a My Fancy Corporation uh, Incorporated welcome page to, you know, here's your first blog post and how to get started, that kind of stuff. Um, that sort of actual at the application layer, uh, interacting with your newly deployed application is something you might need to do when you're provisioning something. So, uh, post install bootstrapping while we're on that, uh, that subject, there's four ways that, that I've seen that we can go about this. Running a single pod, so this is a, this is a, a single container effectively. Running a single pod to completion in your cluster is a very effective, simple way to do this. Um, I've seen it be very successful. So you would make a container that maybe just has a script, maybe it uses uh, config management, whatever you would otherwise normally do outside of a containerized cluster. You put that into a container, that container runs, it does whatever is necessary, it exits, done, easy. There's a job primitive in Kubernetes that you could use. Um, I found it to be more complex than uh, than is really necessary or worthwhile for this kind of application. Um, but it is available if you needed to do something like 
batching or automated restarting uh, in case this thing fails, then it really becomes useful. For this case, I would say not so much. Uh, you could just use your normal config management however you normally run it. If you are a puppet shop and you use puppet to do this kind of stuff, you could just keep doing that and it just happens to be running in, inside a cluster now uh, instead of the old-fashioned way. Uh, or just manual tasks, that's the age-old way, you just log in your app and, and make whatever changes you need. But hopefully we can automate you out of that. Uh, okay, so we talked about provisioning, what kind of things you need to do. So what stuff do you need to actually get that done? That's all of this stuff. So you need that big pile of YAML uh, that, that is the declarative state to Kubernetes saying, this is what I want uh, to have. You need uh, some assets related to your external services. Uh, location and credentials are the two ways we normally think about that. So location would be just like maybe a hostname and a port, a URL, something along those lines. Credentials is however you need to authenticate to that service. So if your DBA provisioned you a database, uh, this is the stuff that they would give you so that you can now connect and use that database. Application assets, uh, you need whatever seed data you're going to put into it. If you are restoring a backup, you need that backup available. Um, configuration you need to have at that time as well. Uh, and that layer varies potentially per deployment, but often you may have a lot of similarity. Um, and then lastly, runtime tooling. So you need some actual tools to do a lot of this stuff. So a template engine maybe just to render the YAML, render the config files, um, or whatever else. Maybe you need actual config management that you'd like to run inside, um, or run it at provision time, however you would like to run it, uh, whether it's Ansible or Puppet or so on. You need some runtime tool. Uh, and then application clients. So if you're interacting with the database, you need maybe uh, a Postgres client or a MySQL client uh, or what have you. So what kind of technology do we know about that we could use to like bundle, like package all this stuff together into one immutable, trackable thing that you can move around uh, and have a lot of confidence in and build and version and so on and <coughs> sign and everything? Of course, it's a container. This is the meta container pattern that you take all the stuff you need at provision time and you stuff it in one container. It's all there, ready to go. Uh, like I said, you can test it, you can put it through a whole life cycle, you can version it, you can track exactly which one did you use to deploy that specific service. Uh, so you, you can answer questions like what version is running right now, uh, you know, what exactly happened when I provisioned this thing. Um, yes, question? I have definitely heard this referred to as an anti-pattern. And oh, it, tell me why? Why is this an anti-pattern? Well, just I mean, just basically like you have immutable containers, yep. and then everyone who's deploying that container in different contexts is building another container on top of it. Well, for one thing, if you're using Docker containers, mm -hmm. they don't support like like a like a kind of a, a, a you, you can't you can't mix in bits of other containers. I'm sorry. Like, oh no. Um, so it, it breaks the. Um, the, uh, the, the efficient uh, incremental build. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. There are things around that. So in this case, um, there there would be no building, no layering of new images on top necessarily. Oh, this is a standalone container that... Yeah, you, this is you make a... This is not your running application. Those are, those are all separate images. Um, this is just all the stuff you need to actually deploy. Okay, that. I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll go through an example. I think it'll clarify that. Uh, so, uh, a meta container, uh, which I'm now going to call a service bundle in our automation broker world, uh, it bundles everything you need at provision time. Uh, and uh, come on and grab a seat. Uh, it runs to completion as a pod into your cluster. Uh, so, just as you would run through all those steps, maybe in a Jenkins system or some other kind of CI previously to deploy your stuff, you're just taking that workflow and putting it inside a container and running it there in your cluster as a container. Uh, and it is fully testable and reproducible. You can put it through uh, you know, a whole QA cycle, uh, promote it to production, and that sort of stuff. And a service bundle does not just have to be for provisioning, of course. Uh, we can do other things with it, like deprovisioning. Binding and unbinding is an interesting area of terminology. That is, if we think back to the coordinates um, of like a host name and a port and some credentials, 
uh, that's, that information is what in our world constitutes a binding. So you would provision a database and then uh, you could ask it for a binding and it would return to you its host name, its port, and whatever information you need to log into it. Uh, updating and other kinds of management operations even, like if you want to run a vacuum on a, a database, or uh, if you want to run a backup, or some other kind of normal management lifecycle stuff, you could certainly implement that in the same pattern. Uh, so any questions about what a service bundle is before we move on to chapter two? Okay. So chapter two is the service catalog that we, uh, we hinted at at the very beginning. Um, so how many of you have ever used like Amazon Web Services for anything? Go, okay, yeah, so most of us, have, and, and those who haven't used it probably have seen it, or at least know vaguely what it is. So Amazon started with this idea of, wouldn't it be great uh, if we could provide infrastructure as a service, and now anybody who wants can, can come in and spin up a virtual machine running their operating system of choice, and we will host it for them, we'll run it for them, uh, we'll keep it running, it runs on our hardware, uh, and they do a little bit of other you know, stuff to help you out. But it's your virtual machine to do with as you please. After they went a little bit down that road, they figured, man, everybody is doing a lot of the same stuff. Uh, if I want to get anything done in my AWS uh, environment, I need to provision a database. And a lot of people are provisioning the same databases. Uh, I need maybe a messaging service and a caching service and all this kind of stuff. So they started providing services side by side with virtual machines. Uh, so you can provision the uh, simple queuing service or the simple storage service, S3, and they will manage a whole service for you and you don't have to think about it or, or manage it in the traditional um, systems engineering kind of way. They take care of it, it's just a service and you get to use it and benefit from that. Kubernetes has a very similar concept of this, uh, this service catalog that services of any kind uh, that uh, would be useful inside your cluster can be developed and can be provisionable in much the same way. So uh, the service catalog provides composable services to applications. So if that gets back to an example of you're working on a development team. You write some kind of web application. You're not a database expert. You just need a database for your application to run. You could use Kubernetes as your environment, both for development and deployment, and you could use the service catalog to self-provision a database whenever you need it into your namespace and then just tie that to your application. So you don't have to worry about deploying it, managing it, and that sort of thing. It's taken care of for you in the catalog. Uh, the actions that the service catalog provides are provision, deprovision, bind, and unbind are the, the basic ones. And this, yeah, this self-service provisioning story is a really wonderful part of this. And this is the general architecture. We have our smiling client on the, on the side there. The client interacts with the service catalog through some, you know, some kind of interface. And the service catalog populates its catalog based on some number of brokers that are the ones doing the real work. The service catalog is like a middleman. Uh, and a broker tells the catalog, I know how to, how to provision a MySQL database and here's some information about what I have to offer, the service catalog then advertises that within the cluster, and when an actual request comes in to the service catalog to provision that thing, the service catalog just passes that on to the broker and says, here, can you get this done for me? And the broker does. Uh, the, the communication that happens there is pretty cool. Um, it's not really worth getting into details of this, but there's this open service broker API that defines how the catalog and brokers interact. So it's made it really accessible for anybody to participate in this ecosystem uh, who wants to make their service provisionable within any Kubernetes uh, environment in the world. Uh, these companies across the bottom have been the primary leaders behind developing this specification and shepherding its life cycle and so on. Um, certainly others have been involved too, but it's been a very nice uh, collaboration to see going on. They're having you know, roughly quarterly face-to-face -face meetings and so on, and weekly calls and, uh, and getting stuff done. Just nice to see collaboration in the name of open source. Okay, oh, it's demo time. Okay. Let's see if we can mirror these things. All 
All right, so here we have, uh, so uh, I use OpenShift mostly. OpenShift is effectively like enterprise Kubernetes. Um, it is Kubernetes with, um, well, for one, a nice beautiful web interface and a wonderful installer and some, some other nice things that aren't worth getting into at the moment. But uh, this is how I use Kubernetes. And we're going to just create a project here called LFNW. And uh, a project is a Kubernetes namespace, effectively. So multi-tenancy is a first-class um, aspect of, of OpenShift. And now we've got this big Browse the Catalog button. So here's our catalog of stuff that we could just click into and deploy right now. Is this Helm? No. This is, this is OpenShift. This, this is OpenShift. Now, we're going to get to Helm. <laughs> uh, this, this is a great question. Um, the, you know, any one of these things could, behind the scenes, be implemented by Helm. But for this purpose, there's multiple brokers right now advertising these things. Um, oh, so this is exposing the brokers that are... This is, this is are yeah, we are interacting with the service... This is a client for the service catalog, and all of these things are being offered by a broker to the service catalog, and then the service catalog to us. Um, and all right, so this this bind one that's logoless. I made this one. Um, bind, this is bind as in the uh, DNS server named D, uh, just to be confusing. This is actually the first one of these service bundles I made when I joined the team. Uh, we can see there's yeah. Um, it only takes one parameter and it's a forwarder, so this is just a local caching DNS server. Very simple, but it it, it made an interesting exercise to get this off the ground. Uh, and we can go ahead and create that. And close, uh, and we can go. Kind of, we can we can watch that start up. It's running a little slow right now uh, on my laptop, but that's fine. So that's that's basically what the service catalog is all about. That's all I really wanted to show for now. We're going to come back and do a more advanced uh, demo in a few minutes. Yes, keep the changes if I can find the button. Okay. We're still live. OK, chapter three is the automation broker. Uh, so we're going to talk about the actual broker that, that I'm working on that we use to automate this stuff. Um, the automation broker exposes each one of those service bundles as a service in the service catalog. So whereas previously, the idea was if you want to advertise a service <coughs> in the service catalog, you would need to go write software and create a new broker that would run inside a cluster and speak that protocol and then be able to actually take action to do whatever's necessary at provision or bind time and so on. Now, uh, with the automation broker, this is effectively the first fully generic broker. In order to add a new service, you just create one of these containers, one of these service bundle containers, tell the broker about it, and it, auto it automatically advertises that as a service in your cluster. Uh, the service bundle runs as a pod to completion. So if, when we click through that bind example, um, behind the scenes, the broker took my, my service bundle, my meta container, created a sandbox environment, a sandbox namespace, with permission specifically to modify stuff in our LFNW uh, namespace we just created and it ran that special service model container inside that namespace, the sandbox namespace, waited for it to finish, and then once it was done, tore the whole thing back down, uh, and then we have a running service, presumably, if we go back and look. So that's just a container, it's not a pod. Uh, it runs. It doesn't restart and stuff. It runs in a pod, um, but, we, but there's a setting on a pod basically about um, restarting. And you're right that by default, when a container exits, Kubernetes gets very upset about that. Uh, it expects your container to keep running. It, it, it deals in services, but you can change the restart policy and effectively tell it, expect that this is going to exit, and that's OK. Yeah, so you, that, that's the one change that we had to make to the pod definition. OK. And uh, of course, you just stick your service bundles in some container registry, and the broker just retrieves them from there. It's pretty pretty handy. Yes? Yeah. So just to, I, 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 OK, so. And, a uh, broker would normally expose an HTTP API because everything in Kubernetes. 
It's true, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, the open service broker API is HTTP. Okay, so you'd have yep. to implement a, a service that did that. Yep. But this is doing that for you, and yep. then the now the, the contract is what? Like, what is your... I, I swear I didn't pay this guy. Um, we're going to talk about the contract next. Um, but, yeah, the contract is the definition of the service bundle. So we have, we have a whole contract written up, documented about what that needs to do and what properties it needs to have, and we have tooling to help you make one. And we're going to look at that in a couple of minutes. But effectively, as long as you make a container that adheres to that service bundle specification, you can use it with the automation <coughs> broker, and it will be exposed as one of these services for you. You don't have to deal with the API, think about the API, deal with running a service, or any of that stuff. So as a service provider, there's, there's some sort of well-known interface I have to support. Exactly, and yeah. And then I can put it in these containers that can be used. Yep. Okay. Yeah, cool. and, and it, it's very simple. We're gonna we're gonna take a look at it. Okay. Um, this is the workflow. Uh, it, there's there's a lot going on here, but effectively you've got a, a person. Uh, this person is, doesn't have a face, unfortunately, but that's okay. Um, they're interacting with the service catalog through some clients. That API is happening, and the automation broker just uses this image registry uh, to know what services it has available to offer. And at provision time, it grabs that thing, runs your service bundle image, uh, and at the end, you get a provisioned service. So this is a standard like image registry? Is there some, is there some metadata that's set on that particular image that, that says it's a face? Yes. Uh, yeah, so we, we discover them a couple of different ways. Um, one is you can just add a suffix to the uh, the repository name for your image, uh, and then in addition to that, we expect to find a label on the container image itself that contains a bunch of metadata about the thing. We're going to look at one of those in just a second, too. Uh, okay, service bundle, um, it does have to implement provision and deprovision. Everything else is optional. It is <laughs> it's discovered by image name and label, uh, just as you asked. And we have this tool called APB, which stands for Ansible Playbook Bundle, um, which is a particular kind of, of bundle that will help you create one of these things. And if you ran that command at the top, APB init, and then give it a name, it creates this metadata file, which is the most basic metadata is needed uh, in terms of saying, this is the name of my service, the description, is it bindable? And then if there if it takes any parameters, like my my DNS bind APB uh, took one parameter that was the forwarders, uh, that would appear right here. But you don't have to take any parameters. This is the, the basic metadata. And going one step further, the an Ansible playbook bundle fits together this way. So we put an Ansible runtime inside the container, and our convention is for each action that corresponds to the Open Service Broker API, provision and deprovision, you make a playbook. So you have provision.yaml, totally normal Ansible playbook, and it uses whatever roles are necessary to do whatever needs to be done, uh, which in most cases, for this sort of use case, is interacting with Kubernetes creating resources, modifying resources, and so on. But in theory, it could do anything. It could interact with off-cluster uh, services, uh, whatever you need to get done. And it's, you know, it's fairly, uh, fairly portable in a lot of cases to take, uh, if you're an Ansible shop already running stuff outside, you know, non-containerized, and you want to become containerized, a lot of that same Ansible assets that you've been using can be uh, you know, moved right into one of these uh, in, and reused. Yes? I'm just wondering, uh, this isn't the contract, right? This is not the contract. So, what, like, um, how does it, like, how are the provision deprovision actions exposed to the, to the, uh, the, the resource? Uh, to, to, so, all right, so, so here, here's how it works. Um, the, the broker is ready to run your service bundle and tell it to provision. The simple overview of the contract is it will run your container with a couple of arguments. The first argument... So it's just a couple of environment variables? Is that... Nope. Command line arguments. Oh, okay. 
Um, the first one is an action, like wow. a word provision. Right. So that's that's the first thing. Um, and it's up to you in your service bundle to just look at that parameter, see what it says, and decide what to do. Uh, and then it also passes in all the parameters and some other context stuff um, that you can, again, just kind of parse and do whatever you need to do with it. But that's really it. It's very simple. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else on that? Um, nope. I think that's all for that. Okay. How do you interact with the service catalog? Um, there's three different ways I know about right now uh, besides just using like curl. So don't squint too hard and look at this. The point of this is just to give you a sense of the look and feel a little bit. There's this command line interface called svcat. Uh, it is improving rapidly. All this stuff is very new, frankly. So it's all improving fairly rapidly. You can uh, in, use that to interact with Kubernetes, um, with the, the service catalog. You can do provisioning and deprovisioning and so on. Uh, it's not the friendliest or easiest or mo most digestible experience yet, but they're working on it. And it's effective, and you can get stuff done. And I have used this and uh, recorded some demos um, that you can see in our YouTube channel if you look there on, on how exactly that works. So that's one option. Um, cube apps, anybody a user of cube apps? Heard of cube apps? Um, this, is, this started actually as a, like a Helm catalog kind of, of just you've got a repository of Helm charts. Um, Helm, by the way, is a package manager kind of for Kubernetes. It's the de facto package manager, in fact. I think it was the very first project to graduate out of the Kubernetes incubator. Uh, and you know, it's, it's effectively a templating engine with some metadata and a life cycle. You can say, here's some templates, here's a name and a version, and some dependency information and so on. And that's the stuff that defines my application. And CubeApps made this this uh, interface to be able to expose those in a point-and-click kind of way. It's very similar kind of self-service uh, provisioning workflow. They very recently added the ability to interact with the Kubernetes service catalog also directly through the same API. This was, this screenshot's from two months ago. Um, I know they've made a lot of improvements since then. Um, it wasn't really quite usable uh, two months ago when I, when I took this, but it was getting there. Uh, I haven't looked at it since, but you might go take a look. I think actually March, late March, maybe about a month ago, they had uh, a couple of releases that started that, that made a lot of big strides. So anyway, that's an option. Looking at this very carefully, I'm very excited for this to grow uh, as a first class point and click kind of uh, experience for the service catalog. And the third one is the OpenShift user experience, which we just looked at. Um, it's very nice. Uh, I like it a lot. Um, it is, it, you know, it's part of OpenShift. Um, so you'd have to use OpenShift, I think, in order to use this interface of the service catalog. Um, I certainly recommend using OpenShift if you're going to, or at least consider OpenShift if you're going to use Kubernetes. Um, but on a, on a like pure vanilla, plain vanilla Kubernetes, um, you would not have this. And uh, there is an Amazon Web Service service broker that you, if you run a Kubernetes cluster like inside AWS, for example, you can expose those very same Amazon Web Services, like a database and a queuing service and that sort of stuff, inside your cluster as a you know, cluster native sort of uh, service. And that service broker is, in fact, the automation broker with a different name on it. Um, so they're using the same pattern, the same technology to provide their services inside Kubernetes. And OK, time for a, a more interesting demo. Okay, here we are. Oh, look, and our, our bind service did start up. We can, uh, one, of the, one, of, you know, one of the favorite demos in OpenShift is just like hit that button and, uh, and you just get a second, nice. second uh, yeah, container that'll be running. Um, again, laptop, you know, conference, network, you got it. Oh, actually, that was not so bad. Um, so yeah, there's two of them now. You can just hit these buttons all day long if you need like a de-stressor. Uh, it's like a, you know, it's like, it's like a fidget spinner on your, on your screen, maybe. Um, so uh, anyway, what we're going to do right now is actually 
delete that service, and we're going to start up two, two different services, and we're going to stitch them together. Uh, so we're going to start with a media wiki, something I'm sure most of us have interacted with at some point in our lives. So this takes all these parameters. I'm just going to set a password, click through, and then we're going to start up a Postgres database. So uh, I noticed there's redundancy. There's uh, two copies of each service definition. Yep. Like one is the APB, which is yep. the, the Android thing, and the other is just Ansible. Awesome. Ansible. Not uh, yeah, not Android. Ansible. Ansible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I'm with you. <laughs> but, uh, so the, the first one is just uh, like a manual definition. Or um, yeah. So there's different brokers here on my OpenShift deployment. Um, one of them is called a template broker. It's a very simple. Just there's a template and it renders the template. Um, and so actually, most of these services here are provided by that broker. The ones that have APB in parameters, which I think is only three of them at the moment, um, are ones that I've brought in for this demo, effectively. There's a lot more, um, but for demo purposes, I tried to get this whole thing you know, self-contained and zero internet required. I almost got there. Um, in any case. All right, so we have these services that have started up. So we have a media wiki. And we have a route. Um, a route is an OpenShift specific thing that it adds um, that's kind of like an ingress controller, if you know what that is. Um, super convenient and, and easy to use. All right, so if we click through, so we see our media wiki, but it's very sad. Uh, it's not configured yet, so it's not actually working <laughs> because it doesn't have a database yet. Um, we also have our database running here. We can see that. Uh, we can see the image came from, it's using the Red Hat software collection image, and so on, exposed support. But we're going to come down to these provision services. And under Postgres, we have this uh, link here that says create a binding. So we're going to do that right now. And effectively, what we get out of that is a Kubernetes secret. And that secret contains that information we talked about before. That is, yeah, password, host name, a, the name of the database, database path, all that kind of stuff. Everything you need to connect to and authenticate um, with that database. We're going to take the secret and add it to an application. And we're going to select MediaWiki. And really all this is, is doing is injecting the secret to the MediaWiki pod as environment variables. We could select it to mount it as a volume instead. That has automatically triggered a redeployment of our media wiki pod. So we're just going to wait a, a moment for that to start up. Uh, now these two services, the media wiki service, these two applications, the actual media wiki application container, is designed to expect a secret to be present that has those specific keys and values in it. Uh, and then it knows what to do with them. So there is still that little bit of like behind the scenes kind of thing. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, that one didn't. Uh, it went down fighting, it looks like. Uh, but that's okay. <laughs> Don't kill me. What have I done to deserve this? Too bad. Um, <laughs> where was I before I started flying around? Um, yeah, uh, so you do have to you know, create your application image in such a way that it will expect to receive credentials in a certain way, depending on what other services you want to be able to inject into it. Um, but that's all fairly straightforward. We can click on our route again, and we have an actual working, running MediaWiki here that we can edit stuff and do all that, but for time, interest, we're not going to right now. That is the broker demo. Uh, okay, uh, let's do a real quick look at one of these actual service bundles. Um, so here, all, all I did in this directory, everybody can read this more or less? Okay. I started by running apb init bind. And 
Um, and it auto-generated all of this stuff for me. And if we look at apb.yaml, this is just the metadata about my bundles. I have a name. I have a single parameter down here. Uh, and so I can specify what type it is, and give a default value, those kind of things. So this is a way you can richly parameterize your service, and that all gets rendered by whatever client you're using, like the OpenShift client, um, as whatever appropriate uh, HTML -y widgets um, are, are the right one for the job. Now, uh, we have a playbooks directory, and we can, we have two playbooks, provision and deprovision. You can guess what those do. And the provision playbook, it, this is all boilerplate. It, every, every bit of this is auto-generated. Generated. I didn't touch any of it. And, but the key part here is this role um, on line 9, the provision bind APB. That's the role that actually does stuff to deploy an application, the one that we are responsible for going and, uh, going and making. Uh, so I went into my roles. Um, I have a prov and these again auto generated uh, with sane defaults. And if you if you're an Ansible user, this looks fairly familiar. So I'm just so I, I made a, a template for that config file just to inject that one config value, and that's it. Very very simple template. It's the same kind of stuff you do in normal Ansible um, work. This is our way of rendering that template. Then here we are telling Kubernetes, please create this. Uh, a config map is a resource in Kubernetes that you can use to mostly track information like a config file um, and inject it into a pod at runtime. So we're saying, take the contents of this rendered uh, config file and stuff that into a Kubernetes secret. We make a deployment config, and this is all a bunch of stuff. You know, this is, we're defining what our container looks like, what image are we going to use, what ports are we exposing, all this kind of normal Kubernetes stuff. If you've ever looked at Kubernetes YAML, this is almost a one-to-one -one mapping of the, the Ansible interface to that um, versus just the like raw Kubernetes YAML files. And we make the service, which is our network presence for this service we just made. Any questions about any of this? I apologize if you're not familiar with these Kubernetes resources. This is at least, you, you now have the look and feel of kind of what it's like to, to define these declarative resources for Kubernetes. Um, that is, let's see, is there anything else in here that we ought to look at? I mean, that's basically it. That's all there is. All I really had to do was add that one parameter. I created this config file with the, as a template and I made just that role that we just looked at to create a few Kubernetes resources, and that was it. And then I had a, uh, a service bundle in there, ready to go. Question? Uh, more general question. Uh, I saw you provision uh, Postgres yes. as, as part of the demo. Uh, so what are you doing for persistent storage as, as part of that? Kubernetes helps you with persistent storage. Um, there are some different primitives for using that, but um, for the most part, there's a, a concept of a cluster administrator, the person responsible for providing infrastructure, um, can add persistent volumes to the cluster and make them available. And there's different ways of categorizing what class of storage, like um, how performant is it, how expensive is it, if you're in an environment where people are charging money for this, um, how, uh, what kind of guarantees for um, durability are there, uh, you know, like you see in Amazon, um, for example, different grades of storage. And then an application deployer claims some of that storage by creating a persistent volume claim. And Kubernetes handles matching those things together. And when you make a claim that I need this much storage of this kind, it goes and finds it for you, hopefully. That's it, yeah. Whether or not you should, whether or not it's reasonable to run a database in a, in a Containerized environment is a subject of much debate, um, uh, and you know the the answer as it so often is is it depends. Um, but that's something we could talk about at the party tonight if you want. Um, other questions? All right. I'll see. Is there anything else uh, I wanted to 
look at. We did that. Oh, yes. Everybody's favorite part of any talk. If you would like a sticker with that goofy logo uh, on your own laptop or whatever, I have a whole stack of them right here. So you should come up and get them. Uh, and with that, um, what other questions do you guys have before we part ways? That automation, we're, we're in there, did it um, actually deploy the binds of container? Uh, as in where, do you mean like, is like, where, I didn't see it actually deploy the bind container. Oh, um, I went back to the de back to the slides and the talk and it, it deployed it while I was talking. Um, but I think we saw it and then I deleted it. Um, but while I was yakking, it deployed it. Can you show us the Ansible code there? That um, yeah, so I mean, it's really, j it's just what we were uh, just it's looking at. YAL. You want to see provision.yaml? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so that's, that's a playbook. And this role is provided in our base image. Um, this role is part of Kubernetes. Um, just comes with Kubernetes. Uh, provision by yep, yes. Uh, so you didn't have to write that? I, most, I spent 99% of my time here in this file writing this. Okay. But even when you run APB init, it gives you a, a beautiful, fully commented out skeletons. Like normally you need a service and a route and a deployment config. Uh, and maybe a secret, or I can't remember if it has an example of that, but yeah. A lot of the time it's just uncomment a bunch of stuff and fill in your values. So yeah, it makes it pretty easy. What else? Yes? I had a question. Um, could you like use the same like service broker API only implement it with different like, for example, you used um, APB, what could you maybe make something that utilizes the Absolutely, yes. So, for example, um, we've been doing a lot of experimenting lately with, you know, as we were talking about the contract before, you can put anything in your service bundle you want. We find Ansible to be very useful, but you don't have to use Ansible. And we've been um, using Helm directly inside one of these containers. Um, so, effectively, there's... The is not that strong. Or it is pretty strong as far as... Your container gets run uh, with, with an entry point, and that entry point is a bash script that can do whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, so, like, in that, in that most basic Helm experiment, we are ba the bash script, we just had it call Helm. And uh, there's, there's details about Tiller, if you're a Helm person, uh, you probably can st you know, see where that's going. Um, so we had to deal with that, but, yeah, you could absolutely run Puppet, you run Chef, you could just run a big pile of bash, um, anything you want, yeah. Other questions? Okay, I'm, uh, I'll be around all day, and um, come find me if you have other questions, you want to talk more, especially tonight. Thanks for coming, and come get a sticker.